Welcome and aloha. Would have been nice to be in Hawaii, but uh, the exciting side of not running it in Hawaii is that we do have so many participants because clearly many of you could only join because this is uh, a virtual workshop and I think it gives us a really good lesson for the future uh, to run these type of events in a more accessible way, in a more um, global way in some way. So the three uh, organizers I'm showing here uh, are online as well. Shauna Morrison from the Carnegie Institution in Washington, uh, Lucia Profita from uh, the Geoinformatics Research Group at Lamont, uh, and myself, who uh, I'm also at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and director of the Geoinformatics Research Group. Why did we organize this workshop? Well, uh, we are all engaged, all three of us, in some way or the other with data science. Uh, some doing active data science, others uh, doing the data management to support data science. So our goal today is to provide researchers and specifically early career scientists with a forum to learn about and discuss methods and tools and specifically also best practices for finding and accessing, mining and analyzing, publishing and citing data. Uh, we want to help researchers take advantage of the growing number and volume of geochemical, petrological, and mineralogical data sets and use data science methodologies and visualization tools to empower their research. What we hope is to get something rolling, actually, consider this workshop as the first of hopefully a series of events uh, that we will run into the future with uh, shorter, hour-long uh, webinars uh, where we will invite uh, researchers doing doing data science or developing new tools to present about them and thus uh, establish a community of practice in geo geochemistry data science. So when we first put out the call, we actually had 134 registrations from 23 countries. We have about half of them on now, uh, which is pretty amazing. I did not expect that. We will make all the um, and the presentations uh, we will record and then make them available uh, through a Zenodo channel. We have provided you with the URL uh, so that others can watch uh, the presentations afterwards. But I think we also achieved our goal in reaching early career scientists in that uh, according to our uh, registration, uh, more than 70% of people who have registered for this workshop are indeed early career scientists. So we just wanted to, to check in with you. What time is it now for you? Because we know uh, that you're sort of all over the world uh, right now from uh, Russia and India and China. And just type in the chat where you are right now, middle of the night, early morning, late uh, evening, that would be really interesting and fun to see. I can't see it right now because <laughs> I can't see the chat while I'm, I'm presenting. So a uh, brief overview of uh, what will happen today. We have organized four sessions. Uh, the first session in a few minutes uh, will be our keynote address by Brennan Keller uh, talking about insights into the operation of the solid earth system from analysis of compiled geochemical data. It's sort of um, an example for the opportunities that data science presents uh, to research and, and scientific discovery in geochemistry and more broadly in geodynamics, I would say. Um, then we have a 15 minute break starting back at 11.15 with the second session um, that uh, we'll focus on geochemical data systems and services that uh, Lucy and I will be presenting. And then starting at 12.30, uh, we will have two sessions um, that will focus on the tools and techniques uh, to use for data science. Uh, and um, we have 
Marshal Ma, Chao Ma, and Chiang Ki. I'm probably mispronouncing it uh, in the first session. And then we have a second session starting at um, a quarter to two in our time zone uh, on cluster analysis and application in geochemistry by, uh, by Dr. Zeng. Okay, uh, just to get started, some housekeeping. We, um, because we are such a big group right now online, um, we will allow questions just to be uh, written down in the chat and one of our moderators will then convey questions uh, from the chat to the speakers. So if you have questions, even throughout the talk, please type them into the chat already. Uh, we will uh, then uh, be able to continue discussions after the workshop is over. Uh, we've set up a channel for EarthChem on Discord, uh, a system that the Goldschmidt Conference uh, has recommended. And I've seen that some people have already signed up and have started to, uh, to put comments into that channel. Uh, at the end of each session, uh, please sign off and connect to a new Zoom meeting. We have done that so that we can record the session separately and make them separately available. You don't have to go through four hours of, of presentations or something to, to find uh, what you're looking for. And as I said already, all sessions will be recorded and then shared both uh, on a YouTube channel and also via the EarthCam community uh, in the Synodo repository. And with that, let's get going with session one on the science opportunities. And I'm very, very happy that Brennan has agreed to give us this presentation. He did that two years ago at a Goldschmidt workshop already, uh, talking about the science. He is really a leader in applying um, the uh, big data analytics for geochemistry. Uh, Brennan the formation of the continental crust and its co-evolution with the biosphere and the surface earth system to better understand the history of the solid earth. And uh, while doing so, he uses a wide range of computational field and geochronological methods uh, to do that. And the two publications that I have showcased a lot in my talks um, are just shown here. Um, one is a 2018 paper uh, on plate tectonics throughout Earth's history and uh, the other one on statistical geochemistry, really something uh, that, that Brennan came up with, uh, are perfect examples for what we want everybody to be able to do. Uh, so with that, I'm handing over to Brennan. I need to stop my sharing and let Brennan get on. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, glad to be here today uh, and th to all the uh, participants as well and uh, Shauna and Lucia uh, and Kirsten for organizing. Uh, so let's see if this Zoom works here. Share screen. This is the first time I've given a longer yes. talk over, <laughs> over uh, Zoom. You are, it's showing well. All right, great. So today I thought I'd talk about some of the things I've learned, um, both about the operation of the Earth system and about doing uh, data, data science in, in uh, the field of ge fields of geochemistry and petrology over the past few years. Uh, actually, quite a few years now. I started working on this back in grad school about eight years ago when I had just started uh, as a grad student with Blair Shaney, uh, who had just been hired at the time. His lab wasn't built yet, he's a uranium-led geochronologist. So I started working with EarthChem data as basically at, at first a side project to fill the time while I was waiting for the lab to get built. Uh, it ended up taking over my whole dissertation and basically my whole career at this point. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, I think I've learned some interesting things about uh, both about the operation of the solid earth system and about uh, data science. And hopefully I'll be able to share a few of those. I'm going to try to go through the traditional talk part of this talk a little bit quickly so that we hopefully have some time at the end to look at some code. Uh, and with that, I'll get started. Okay, so first motivation. Motivation for the, the talk part of the talk. Uh, one part of the motivation, you know, what got me interested in, in this particular pr 
project when I started working with EarthChem data uh, is understanding the formation and evolution of Earth's continental crust. Uh, given that this is a Goldschmidt workshop, this is probably a, a pretty, uh, pretty familiar concept to most of you here, but just to spell it out, because Earth's crust is the boundary between the surface Earth system and the deep solid Earth, uh, and because m m most of Earth's mass is solid, not liquid, but we really care about you know, the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere uh, for you know, evolution origin of life reasons, uh, the solid Earth is really critical if you want to understand the evolution of the whole Earth system and the survival and evolution of life on billion-year timescales. Uh, another motivation for the talk is as a case study of what can be done with existing freely available data sets, uh, especially in this case, EarthChem. Uh, and the take home point here is that there's plenty of fundamental exploratory science to be done with freely available public data sets. And I, I think everyone here will probably agree with that. It, the data, data availability keeps growing. The things we can do with it um, keep getting more complicated and precise. So there's, you know, there's all the trade offs of you can use more and more complicated models, but hopefully still uh, you can only take that so far uh, without, without making your model as complicated as, as the real world. Uh, but the more data you have, the more likely you are to be able to obtain some actual insight into how the, the system works. Okay, so uh, everyone here probably knows all about plate tectonics. Uh, this is the obligatory intro slide. There's a bunch of places uh, on Earth where magmas are produced today by plate tectonics. You know, all the highlighted here, your favorite arcs, rifts, etc. cetera. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, at none of these is magma primarily produced by increasing temperature. Uh, that, that's actually not the case. Instead, it's either decreasing pressure, decreasing pressure of the mantle at plumes at rift and rifts, or adding water, flux melting at arcs. Um, out of all of those, uh, if you take off all the labels, there's probably some other things that, that stand out. There's basically two types of crust here. This, oh, my pointer is not going to work here. Uh, low elevation oceanic crust on the left and high elevation continental crust on the right. If you look at the composition of these, it's not just, it's, there is a difference in thickness between the two. The continental crust is thicker, but, but the difference in elevation is more than that. It's also that the continental crust is more felsic. It's got more, say, quartz, orthoclase, plagioclase. The mantle has more olivine and pyroxene, which are more mafic, denser, higher in iron and magnesium, lower in silica. Um, usual intro petrology uh, things. So this gives us uh, an oceanic crust that's more dense, a continental crust that's less dense, uh, which helps the continental crust be subaerial, be higher elevation above the above sea level. The, this is pretty simple but it's also pretty rare in the solar system. So if we look at the, you know, the hypsometric profile, this is just, you, if you add up over um, you know, some, some elevation relative to uh, a geoid, a gravitational equipotential surface, uh, is, is your crust higher than, than the average, lower than the average, or what? Many planets are unimodal. So Mercury just has that one peak right near zero, right near the geoid. Venus just has one peak. Titan has one peak. The moon has one peak. Earth has two, and they're quite distinct. You, you, you might guess the upper one is the elevation of the continental crust, you know, sort of flat plateau just above sea level. The lower one at about minus four, minus five kilometers is the ocean basins. Uh, that, that's somewhat unusual. Mars actually has something slightly like this, but that's actually uh, the, the, the northern hemisphere dichotomy. It's thought to be basically a, a relic impact crater. There's no uh, bimodality and density to go with that bimodality and topography. So if Mars had an active hydrological cycle like Earth does, that bimodality would go away. You'd get eroded down. So the fact that Earth has this bimodality and that it's robust against uh, the forces of weathering is pretty unique. And it really relies on the fact that you have, you have these two different compositions. So having a co continental crust that's a different composition than your oceanic crust is, is key here. You know, say, say it was all the same density, we would, we would have, we would have effectively expect to have a water world um, where all of, you know, say, flatten out all the continents to the same elevation as the ocean basins. If you didn't have this bimodality, we would not expect to have as much emerged um, continental crust, as much emerged silicate crust. And that would be a bit of a problem because there's this uh, really important concept that you've probably all heard of, uh, the silicate weathering feedback, where if you have silicate minerals here in the the sort of trivial example case of elastinite, um, calcium pyroxene, 
you have silicate minerals exposed to the atmosphere, to CO2 in the atmosphere, they can react with that CO2, uh, basically consume it, sequester it as solid carbonates, which takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you get too hot, say if, you're, if your PCO2 grows, uh, I can't point at the, um, can't point at the, the arrows here, but if your PCO2 grows, that's going to increase your temperature, which will increase your weight, rate of silicate weathering, which will then consume CO2, so you go back to normal. Uh, it'll, it'll do the, the same thing in all these indirect ways, so increasing planetary temperature increases the weathering rate, increasing precipitation increases physical weathering, which is going to increase the chemical weathering rate, um, and just higher uh, concentration of CO2 itself, you know, more, essentially more acidity of rainwater is going to increase the rate of silicate weathering. So all these things combine uh, to form this really powerful negative feedback mechanism that's critical for the stability of liquid water on Earth on long time scales. Uh, if it weren't for this, then say, say we had a water world, we, we eroded the continents flat, we had no crustal bimodality, great, except now our silicate weathering feedback is much less stable. There's a decent chance of, say, going the route of Venus, boiling off all that, um, all that ocean, and being stuck with either a uh, you know, fully evaporated greenhouse or a, or a permanent snowball state. You didn't have a good silicate weathering feedback. Fortunately, we do, but this, this crustal bimodality is, is really important to it. Um, but then coming back to this bimodality, the reason we should, why should we have any bimodality in density, which helps gives us the bimodality in elevation, given that if we look at all our sites of magmatism that we highlighted a minute ago, the primary flux of magma from the mantle to the crust is basalt in both cases. You know, the only thing you get out of melting a mantle peridotite is going to be some type of basalt. You know, you're never going to get a granite out of there. So why is continental crust more felsic than oceanic crust? Basically, there's got to be something going on in this box. And uh, the, the usual answer is that this is in some way deeply tied to, to uh, hydrous flux melting, subduction, being different than the other types of melting. Uh, there are a few sort of um, uh, intuitive reasons why you might expect that to be the case. Adding water to a magma decreases its viscosity, and it also decreases uh, the solidus temperature, the temperature at which it freezes. So the wetter your magma is, the easier it is to differentiate by fractional crystallization, because you can actually, if it's less viscous, you can physically separate crystals out more easily, so you can make a turn a basalt into a granite by fractional cr crystallization more easily when it's wet, just in terms of rate, time scale. Uh, at the same time, uh, that same, same water that you've added to your basalt, if it's decreasing the solidus temperature, that means it's easier to keep the magma hotter, say in the deep crust or middle crust, for longer, for long enough for that fractional crystallization to actually happen. So there's a few reasons why we might expect from first principles that hydrous melt should lead to better differentiation. But if you want to have flux, hydrous flux melting, you need to have subduction. Uh, essentially, you need to have plate tectonics. Uh, but there's very little, um, very little consensus in the literature about when plate tectonics started. There have been, th this is a somewhat old figure now, Cornaga 2013, but there's, there's um, proposed initiations all the way from basically the Neo-Proterozoic to sometime in the Archean. Since this has come out, we've gotten maybe one more paper proposing Neo-Proterozoic, uh, a bunch more various times in the Archean, anywhere between, basically a bunch lately between 3 and 3.8. Basically, uh, still, no, still no complete consensus, substantial divergence. And I guess you could put, uh, you could put this talk as, as one, of, one of the ones on there too. But um, this is tied, of course, to crustal growth rate. So here we have on the x-axis time going forward from the uh, formation of the Earth, so not um, billion years ago, just billion years forward. Um, all of the models have some sort of growth. There's usually an assumption that the, the Earth starts with no, uh, no continental crust, which is probably a good assumption to some degree. Uh, there are some models that have crustal growth basically starting in the Archean, uh, perhaps coincident with in those models onset of plate tectonics. Others have much earlier crustal growth. Those are usually correlated with um, researchers who also want an earlier start to plate tectonics. But again, uh, this is also, also some old figure, but there's still no consensus since the time this figure was published. So this leaves us with some fundamental questions. Uh, how is continental crust produced? How has the composition of preserved continental crust changed over time? And how long has plate tectonics been operating on Earth? 
Okay, so this is where we get to the, the start of the data science part of this. So the analogy I always use, so apologies to anyone who has seen this before, but the analogy I we'll always use when thinking about time, when I always use when thinking about time series data in geochemistry is to uh, atmospheric composition, atmospheric temperature. So this record here is this, this famous uh, Vostok ice core record, uh, which is measuring temperature really only at the site of, of uh, ice deposition um, in Antarctica. But from that, just looking at that one place, you can see some pretty clear global trends. But of course, this is scale dependent. So if you, if you zoom in on just one little box of this record, say looking just over, over a few tens of thousands of years, it, it's kind of hard to obtain a, an overall process out of this record. But if you look at a longer time scale, temporal records, records with time as the x-axis are kind of uniquely useful in giving you process. Um, and in this case, you can see these cycles of glaciation and deglaciation and glaciation, deglaciation repeated. And you can see that just from looking at the data. And you can see this just from looking at, importantly, geochem it's ultimately it's a, it's a deuterium isotope based record. Uh, geochemical data collected at one point on Earth's surface it can tell you about the whole Earth. That's kind of uh, impressive, right? You can't do that with solid Earth geochemical data uh, nearly as easily. So Earth's crust is chemically heterogeneous. This is looking at, in this case, um, composition of, of uh, Earth chem data mostly. Uh, I think this is about 70,000 data points of you know, basalts through granites. How much, how much sodium do they have over time? Uh, this is basically, this is a mess. Uh, the problem isn't like we have time on the axis. We have all the time we want. We still can't see anything. Um, so in order to, to get from this really heterogeneous record to something that can tell us about global process, say, you know, plate tectonics, secular mantle cooling, what do we have to do? Okay, so uh, the first thing, which I've already really um, implied a few times, is the choice of independent variable is really critical. You know, what are you, what is the x-axis of which you're going to try to look at variation of some other quantity over? Um, so just for a geochemical, anal uh, geochemical example here, say you wanted to understand, you know, these are, these are two, Pretty, um, pretty heinous ratios that only a geochemist would like. Um, but say you wanted to understand what was driving the change in the rubidium strontium ratio of igneous rocks as a function of their lutetium hafnium ratio. So they're both sort of you know, radiogenic ratios. So uh, you can see why some people, geochemists might be interested in these ratios for some reason. This is if you treat lutetium hafnium as the x-axis, this is the independent variable. Say, oh, let's, let's change that and see how the rubidium strontium varies as a function of that. Okay, that's one answer. Turns out we could do the same thing flipping what our independent variable is though and get a completely different answer. So here we've used in the blue, the blue air bars, we're using uh, rubidium strontium as the independent variable. Uh, we get a completely different answer. Neither of these is actually particularly informative in this particular case. Turns out you can do much better if you use say something like silica as the independent variable. So in this case we have uh, the red and blue curves, that's uh, plutonic and volcanic, but, um, and the, the tie bars indicate um, pairs of equal silica. You can largely ignore the volcanic versus plutonic um, part of the story here and basically just look at what happens as you go from the darker um, symbols and error bars in the lower right corner to the brighter symbols and error bars in the sort of top left. As you go along that curve, silica is what's actually changing. That's what's actually that's something that you can actually use as an independent variable. Say, as you differentiate your rock, your silica is going to generally go monotonically up as you go through fractional crystallization or partial melting or any other process. Uh, the, more you, the more you differentiate, the higher in silica you're going to be. If you treat that as the independent variable, you, you actually start to see something useful here. So you see that at first, your lutetium hafnium ratio goes down, which is probably a function of, say, minerals like garnet or amphibole that, can, that contain a bunch of lutetium crystallizing out of your system. And then at some point, uh, and your rubidium strontium doesn't change, change so much, but then at some point, um, your feldspars start saturating. So say, uh, especially probably in this case, a, a plagioclase feldspar that has a lot of strontium in it. At some point, right around the bend in the curve, that starts saturating. Uh, you're probably done at that point growing much garnet um, in your system, so your, your lutetium hafnium trend now reverses. 
fact, now we're probably crystallizing zircon, so half of them goes back up, rubidium strontium goes up, and you, you, can, you can look at this in this way and assign these trends to actual things that minerals, real minerals are doing uh, in your magma as you're crystallizing it. But that only works if you pick the right independent variable. We wouldn't have been able to do that with these curves a slide ago. So uh, choice of independent variable really matters. You need to cho choose something that really is driving the system and not something that's, that's a second order consequence of that. Uh, another important take home point, I would say, uh, for any analysis of geochemical data, and really even extending beyond geochemistry, uh, is, that, is that data are generally distributions, not points. We often think of data as, say, like your points in some x, y, or higher dimensional space, but really there's an uncertainty on almost everything. So in this case, we have age versus arbitrary uh, y-axis variable. There's going to be uncertainty on each of these. Say you want to bin these by age and you know, calculate an average for each bin. You could do something like this. OK, that's, that's pretty easy. We get this. We get some sort of trend. We have much larger uncertainty on the left. But we're sort of implicitly assuming when we do this binning that the x-axis uncertainty is smaller than the size of the bins. If it's larger, then you're going to get a completely different answer. So imagine, say, that our, our x-axis uncertainty is actually these, these massive error bars here. Well, if we really want to see what's happening over time, then, we, then we, we need to represent this uncertainty. We need to represent the whole distribution. And there are more elegant ways of doing this, which I think uh, may actually talk about later in this session. But the, what I tried first was, was basically a brute force approach to this problem is just to resample, to draw from that distribution, which is equivalent to taking the data and adding Gaussian noise if the uncertainty is Gaussian. So if we do that, resampling, now you see that the, the data is actually telling us something very different than we first thought. We calculate a bin now, we're going to get a very different answer than in the case where we incorrectly assumed that the x-axis uncertainty was far less than the bin size. OK, so geochemical data are distributions, not points. That especially matters uh, for the uncertainty on your independent variable, whatever that is. Uh, one other geochemistry, but also with, with relevance to data science beyond geochemistry point, is that the natural statistic for your distribution may not be the natural statistic for your physical system. So here's, um, here's data drawn from a log normal distribution, which is a distribution that trace element data often follows on Earth. Uh, so you see you have, we have many values near zero, very few values at higher, um, higher value. Uh, so say higher trace element concentration in this case, but there's this really long tail that extends out far to the right. Uh, so say we, we zoom in on this a little bit so we can actually see our means and whatnot. Uh, there's sort of a long-standing tradition that in, both in geochemistry and sort of qualitative uh, traditional data analysis in a lot of fields that outliers are bad and you want to get rid of those. Um, that is sometimes very true, but there are also cases where it's not true, especially if that, if that outlier re represents an extreme real value. Um, so, so in order to in order to say avoid the outliers, people will often use a metric like the median. So uh, here's your geometric mean, which is geometric mean is the actual, uh, that's the actual natural statistic for a log normal distribution. So you might say, okay, that's what we want to use to characterize this distribution. On some level, that's true. Uh, and the median does a much better job of uh, approximating that than the mean does. Our mean's way up here, uh, over about six. But, let's, but imagine, say, this was, this was uranium value. Uh, on the x-axis, and we wanted to calculate the average heat flow through the continental crust with uranium concentrations given by this statistic. Well, is the heat flow through the crust as a whole, is it going to be reflective of the median or the, the geometric mean? No, it's going to be <laughs> the, the average heat flow through the crust is going to be in line with the mean. So if you try, if you try to you know, quite understandably avoid outliers by using the median or characterize the distribution using its quote unquote natural statistic, but in this case, the geometric mean. That's great from one perspective, but it's not great if what you're interested about is what you would get if you actually took all those rocks and mixed them together. Um, so the mean is the, the normal arithmetic mean, kind of uniquely useful if what you're concerned about are the bulk properties of the entire crust or of some set of rocks mixed together. You know, the median has a much less obvious physical interpretation. You know, so the median of, of all these rock compositions would be, oh, let's line up all the rocks in Earth Chem together uh, and pick the one in the middle. 
Uh, whereas the mean is, let, let's put them all in a giant blender and mix them together. Uh, the median one won't tell you anything about, say, uh, that won't even give you the median heat production of the continental crust. It will just give you something that's totally unrelated to the actual mixed average. OK, uh, that's, that's sort of my soapbox for um, data analysis here. Coming back now to uh, this record of sodium versus time. What do we have to do if we want to actually get a usable record out of this? You know, we, comparing this to, say, that Vostok ice core record from a few slides ago, we can't see any average trend, even though we have lots of time. So um, take home points here. Time is uniquely useful as an independent variable. You can be guaranteed that it's always going to be independent. No, none of your other processes are changing it. So it's always, it's always valid to bin as a function of time and take the mean of that. Um, but identifying slow change requires a long record. The other take home point here, which is why we don't see anything uh, in this just raw sodium versus time data set is <laughs> in this case, it's really just that the atmosphere is much more well mixed in the lithosphere. You can sample the atmosphere in one place, say something about global temperature. Uh, if you want to reproduce that with uh, a lithosphere record, you're probably going to have to do the averaging yourself. Uh, so this sort of mixing can be really helpful when interpreting a complicated record. Uh, in this you know, atmosphere versus uh, lithosphere case, the natural case is, is basically just a fundamental viscosity contrast. The atmosphere is much less viscous, so it mixes itself. But the lithosphere, if we want to tell the average over time, we have to do that mixing manually. And in doing so, we have to take care of noting that each datum is, is, that, is a distribution, not just a point. OK, uh, so this leads to uh, a hypothesis of if we want to see through all this, the noise in this record, uh, if we gather as much unbiased data as possible and then analyze it with you know, keeping in mind all the points we just went through, but independent variables and uncertainty and resampling, we should actually be able to get at, say, secular cooling over time or influence of plate tectonics over time. So we're going to need a lot of data. It's going to have to be, uh, in this case, igneous, volcanic, or plutonic will we'll do. We're going to want spatial coordinates, and we're going to want age constraints. If we, we definitely need the spatial coordinates if we want to try to obtain even sampling, we need the age constraints because we're going to use age as our independent variable. Uh, so this was starting way back in 2012 now, I started with about 67,000 samples from EarthChem that had age constraints and all the geochemistry I wanted, and about 2,500 from Camp Condi and 1,500 from Jean-Francois Moyen. Um, here's all the sample locations. This is looks very similar to a map of all EarthChem sample locations. And you can see they're very much not even, but we do have a sampling of all the continents and all of the different tectonic environments active on Earth today. So in order to try to obtain an even uh, uh, average over space and time, the approach uh, that this is back to Keller Shaney 2012, the approach that we took there was this uh, weight, um, weighted bootstrap resampling. So the weight uh, in weighted bootstrap resampling is basically this equation. So that if you say you have this distribution of points in the picture here, a bunch of low, a bunch of points all from the same same region in the in the lower left, and then a few right on few. Uh, much more sparse points out by themselves. The idea for the average is that the sparse points are giving you more information per point than the, than the dense points. Essentially, if we could add one more point to this data set from anywhere, we wouldn't want to add another one from here. We'd want to add another one from somewhere else in the crust. So this, um, this weight is essentially how often we are likely to resample if we're, if we're pulling a subset from the, from the whole data set. Uh, how are, often are we likely to include that in our resample? Uh, and that's just inversely proportional to sample density in space and time. So here's the whole workflow. You start with your data set, apply the weights, resample in proportion to the weight. That's useful. Really, the more critical point, if you were going to implement this yourself, is less the weighting and more the fact that we're adding Gaussian noise to represent the uncertainty. That's this point about you know, each datum is a distribution. Uh, then we bin by our independent variable here, uh, age, and repeat this many times to calculate the variation of the mean. So the distribution of mean, the mean is not the distribution of the data, um, caveat. The, the distribution of the mean is, is usually Gaussian, even the distribution of the data is not. Um, so you can, catch it, you can represent this as a mean and standard error of the mean, like two sigma standard error of the mean in, in all the figures subsequently. So here's what this actually looks like if we now apply it to a previously really messy data set where we see no trend over time. Raw data, you can resample it and see that these sort of discretized 
lines where people have just rounded, oh, that's 2.2 GA. Uh, these get spread out because there's actually quite large uncertainty on those. And then when you calculate your bin mean, two sigma error of the mean through time, hooray, we can see a trend now. Great. Okay, so back to the motivating uh, question here. The primary flux of magma from the mantle to the crust is basalt in all environments. Let's look at the basalts first and see what we can learn from that. The first things uh, that, that Blair and I saw when we started working in, on this was that there were trends in compatible and incompatible elements. So elements that would rather stay in the mantle. So see here your little, little um, diagram. Uh, olivine crystal, compatible element would rather stay in the, the mineral, incompatible would rather be in the melt. Uh, this is Goldschmidt, you all know that. Um, as you increase fraction of melt, your incompatible elements are going to decrease in abundance in the melt. Compatible elements are going to increase. Okay, great. So uh, the, the record we see here is, is going from, from the Archean to the present. Things like magnesium and chromium that would rather stay in the mantle, they become less abundant in basalts. Things like sodium, potassium, or say uranium if we wanted to think about it. Heat production, again, are increasing in abundance in the crust through time. Great. Consistent with decreasing mantle melt fraction through time. We can then take this a step further and say, can we actually estimate a quantitative melt fraction through time from this? So uh, the way I did this first was with melts. So essentially, you, just, you start with a, a primitive mantle um, prototype, melt it one, two, three, all the way up to 100%, compare all those simulation results to the observed composition of each result in the data set, find which percent melt matches best uh, for all the resampled samples. Um, there, yeah, this is, the, this is the obligatory melt slide. Melts is, there are now new versions that are, I think uh, Thermo Engine is maybe a replacement for melts now, which is a, the open source Python and Objective-C package, but it's based on all the same uh, code from um, um, Fiorso and folks. So this was, this was p-melts because we were using, using primitive, uh, primitive mantle and basalts. Uh, but you, you put in a composition, you get, out, uh, you get out the composition of the melt. And we can then estimate through time with all that, all that resampling and all apparent mantle melt percent through time. So here's the record we get. Uh, about 10% on average at the present of out of, I should say, importantly, this is all out of basalts that are today part of the continental crust. So today, that's, if you look at what, where basalts are actually being added to the crust today, that's in, in no small part arc basalts, some rifts, but really quite a lot uh, from arcs. If you go back to the Archean, you get much higher melt percents. And this is presumably the influence of things like commodiites, very high magnesium magmas, uh, that were produced by much higher degrees of partial melting of the mantle. If you look at the, the subcontinental lithospheric mantle under the crust back in the Archean, you see it's, it's been depleted in, in melt by about that much. So great. That lines up. Uh, we were surprised, though, to see this sort of jump right at the European Proterozoic boundary. That was interesting. Uh, and that showed up in a lot of different variables. So here's a bunch of uh, trace elements that Amy's just like. So lanthan meterbium tells you something about um, well, garnet and amphibole. Uh, lanthanum samarium is maybe the more, more, um, more direct to the amphibole side of that, uh, Samarium meterbium, the, the heavier earths, is more the garnet side of that. Uh, both of these change rapidly over this interval. Um, oh, pyroxene as well, I should say, uh, can, can influence these. And then zirconium is another, another incompatible trace element that we all like uh, if you think about zircon. All of these change sort of rapidly over this time period, which was interesting. And, and I should say this, this change in apparent percent melt is surprising also just from a, a purely physical perspective that, that the mantle's really big, it's going to be hard to <laughs> presumably to change melting extent really fast. Uh, there's a lot of thermal inertia there. OK, so what are we looking at? Lanthanum ytterbium. This is uh, because of the lanthanide contraction. Lanthanum and ytterbium are very similar, except for their size. Ytterbium is smaller. Um, so, so geochemists love it for that reason. Um, and Garnet pre prefers this, this YB3+. Plus. So here's our lanthanum ytterbium over time. This is a really dramatic change in results. Uh, so when we first saw this, I said, you know, is this, is this onset of plate tectonics? You know, what's going on here? Um, we, we saw pretty quickly that you can't explain this with a constant single partition coefficient with the extent of mantle melting that we saw. So if you make this fit in the Archean, it doesn't fit um, subsequently in the model, or if you make it fit for the, for the post-Archean, then it doesn't fit in the Archean. 
no matter you know no matter what partition coefficient you choose, if you keep it constant, uh, it's not going to work. So we need something else. Uh, you need we need to either change the partitioning, we need to change the mantle composition. So we could do that through say starting subduction, changing the style of subduction, or changing some other uh, some of the other systematics of mantle melting. So coming back to to test this first one, subduction initiation, coming back to our arcs. Unique thing about these arcs is that we're adding water uh, at each of these. And water brings with it, of course, other elements. Some elements are more fluid mobile than others. We've got over, say, in the, the alkali metals, the one plus alkali metals, those are all very soluble. It's basically size to charge ratio is a, is a large influence on fluid solubility. So these are very soluble. Um, two plus alkali earths, less so. And then when you get over to say your five plus niobium tantalum, those are very insoluble in aqueous fluids. So we, this is this can all be checked experimentally. So this is from uh, a somewhat classic paper now, Tetsumi 1986, which is actually looking at the fluid coming out of serpentine at 12 kilobar. And you can see that say your cesium, rubidium are extremely fluid mobile, your niobium, not so much. So we should expect if this were an uh, onset of plate tectonics, basically a a step change in the, abun in the abundance of slab, fl slab fluid introduced uh, incompatible elements. So say your, your rubidium and cesium should jump way up at this time relative to uh, an equally incompatible fluid immobile element. So do we see this over time? Here's one of the classic ratios, niobium thorium. Niobium is the less fluid mobile one. And these have very similar partition coefficients uh, in under mantle melting and both very incompatible. So they shouldn't be affected much by this change in melt fraction we were looking at before. Uh, do, we see, do we see a switch here? Well, not really. We've been sort of consistently on the arc-like end member all the way back to the, the start of our record, 3.8, 3.85 issue up, basically. OK, what about some other, some other elements? Could try, let's try almost the most too extreme. Let's try rubidium versus niobium. Um, Hmm. Consistently like modern arcs. I see these are the modern end members here. Okay, there you know there's some variation, there's some noise, there's some uncertainty, but consistently more towards the arc end member, or consistently similar to modern levels of fluid input. If we're if we're going to make the interpretation from that, those are trace elements though. Trace elements are relatively low in abundance, so they can get reset by metamorphism, say. Uh, and if we're thinking about fluid mobile elements, that's perhaps especially a concern. So let's try something else. Um, there's this quantity we can look at instead that's entirely based on major elements. It's going to be much harder to reset by alteration or metamorphism. Uh, this is uh, on the y-axis here, the tholeitic index, which is just how much iron we have for magmas with four weight percent magnesium versus how much iron we have in magmas with eight weight percent magnesium. So if, if it does, if there's no change as you differentiate your result from eight weight percent magnesium, which would be somewhat primitive, down to four, you'd be at one along this line. Uh, modern uh, modern rift and plume basalts are above one, so their iron is increasing as they differentiate. Modern arc basalts are decreasing uh, in iron as they differentiate, and this is effectively because what, the same water that uh, produces flux melting in in arc settings. Uh, basically, it, it decreases the melting temperature, it decreases the stability of uh, minerals like, let's say, plagioclase, and it increases, uh, if, you, if you have a higher redox state, you increase the relative, relative stability of, of your, your oxides, basically your magnetite and your ilmenite. They don't care about th their solidus or their saturation temperature is not decreased by having more water, so they saturate relatively earlier. And as you differentiate from 8% uh, magnesium down to 4, they consume your iron in a, in a, in a calc alkaline arc magma. Whereas in a dry magma, that those minerals haven't saturated yet and you're increasing in iron as you differentiate. So uh, this, is a, this is a pretty basic, uh, pretty basic signal. It's really hard to mess up. Uh, and if we look at it through time, we're consistently, again, more towards the arc than rift end member. Uh, and I would say really importantly, consistently below one, consistently calc alkaline all the way back to you know, 3.8, 3.85. So to me, this, this rules out uh, subduction initiation as the cause of our step change at 2.5 GA, which leaves us with this last mantle melting systematics option. So if we look at what actually happens in terms of percent melt as a function of temperature, this is again in, uh, uh, just a melt simulation, but uh, in this case, a 2.7 GPA with a, a primitive mantle, 
I think 0.015% water. Uh, as you increase temperature, the melt percent response is not linear. It's, it's quite nonlinear. And in particular, there's some kinks in it when we run out of certain uh, minerals in the source mantle. So as you, as you go, go above a certain temperature, you reach clinopyroxene out. Similar thing for garnet out. Interestingly, this clinopyroxene out kink happens right at about you know, 27, 28% melt, uh, which is, if you look back to our old percent melt figure, it, it's right about this, this gap between the Archean and Proterozoic. Um, so in, this is also uh, perhaps an interesting time to bring in that even though we saw this jump in percent melt right around 2.5, there's no jump in the estimated temperature from the same melt simulation. So that's basically telling us already, I, you know, I didn't show it before, that, that's already telling us this is not necessarily a sudden change in mantle temperature that produced that jump, but a change in the melting systematics. It's already a hint of that. Okay, but we, we can go much further with this. Let's look at the actual residual mineralogy of the mantle as we melt a critotite, say 10, 20, 30%. This is for, yeah, again, 2.7 GPA primitive mantle uh, under somewhat arc-like somewhat arc conditions. Your garnet and clinopyroxene are both exhausted at about just below, just below 30% melt. That's presumably going to change the partitioning coefficients, right, of between your mantle and your melt, between your solid and your melt. So we can model this. Um, if we take this, this apparent melt percent uh, through time, see through time where that puts us on these curves and calculate a partition coefficient. Uh, this is using germ partition coefficient data for, for all of these all the trace elements we're interested in, in this case, lanthanum and terbium, you can see that there is, there is indeed a big change in the, in the KDs of these two elements as we approach garnet and clinopyroxene out. Okay, that's interesting. We can put this all together as a, as a forward model, say, what, what would we expect the lanthanum and terbium trend to do over time, knowing only this change in melt percent and starting with the same composition for each, and we get uh, what I would say by geochemical standards is a really good fit, um, a surprisingly good fit. So this change, well, we couldn't make it fit with a constant partition coefficient. If you just take into account the fact that the partition coefficients are naturally going to want to change as you change melting extent, then you can fit the data quite well. Uh, you can do this for, for various other elements. It all works, right? So coming back to our fundamental questions here, uh, my proposal for, for the answers to these three is one, uh, the composition of preserved continental crust has changed largely as a response to secular mantle cooling over time, which changes, this changes, say, compatible and incompatible element abundances, not so much silica. So not, not necessarily a more mafic crust in the past, just one that was higher in magnesium. Uh, I would say plate tectonics, or at least uh, subduction-associated flux melting has been happening throughout the preserved rock record back to you know, 3.8, 3.85. Seems like this is, this is maybe consistent with some of the newer constraints that, uh, that other studies are getting. Um, I think Ann Bauer has one that, that's, you know, 3.8, 3.85, that's, that's potentially consistent. Uh, I would be fine if it was even earlier than that, but my record only goes back so far. Um, how is continental crust produced? I'm going to say uh, fractional crystallization of hydrous arc magmas, but uh, that's, you know, time to go into that. So um, take home points for geochemical data science from this, uh, from this, this case study. One, I would say, is data is abundant. The hard part is the interpretation. Two, we always want to keep in mind that every input data is almost always a distribution, not a point. Uh, so the, the, the longer throughout the, the data analysis process that we can propagate that full distribution, the better. Um, failing to identify the true independent variable or, or just taking averages over something that is not the independent variable of the system can lead to wrong conclusions easily. So think carefully about that. And think carefully about your choice of, of uh, sample statistic, if there is one. So a, the robust statistic, like the median, may not be the one for the system you're considering. So say if you want to estimate you know, heat production of all shales on Earth or all granites on Earth, you definitely want the mean. If, say, you want to use, sw switching to a sedimentary perspective for a minute, say you want to use shales to estimate seawater composition, though, that's very different. Then you do want to exclude outliers that are, say, diagenesis or alteration post uh, post deposition, you know, outliers that are not telling you anything about the, the seawater from which that shale formed. But if what, what you're interested in is what is the bulk composition of the crust, then 
you do want to include those in wires. So, so it totally depends on what process you're studying, but you, you have to think carefully about this. Um, and the last point by computer science state standards, our data is small, but our parameter space is large. So basically if, it, you know, if your data fits in memory, it's, it's small data. Uh, and if you're on a cluster, that can be a petabyte. So uh, uh, big, you know, you, what you call big data or small data can vary, but by any standards, the parameter space we have as geochemists is massive, which gives us, you know, so, so parameter space could be the geochemical variables, it could be pressure, temperature, depth, um, things like that. The parameter space we have is huge, and the, the data sets have enough variables that there's plenty we can do in parallel. Uh, so say if you want to do melt simulations on every composition or perplex simulations on every composition, you can do that. You can do that with high performance computing on a cluster. Um, all right, so the last thing that I wanted to have time for was two things that I think are going to be really important in the future of data science. Uh, I think this will be important not just for geochemistry, but for all of data science. Uh, and I wanted to put in a quick shout out for both of these, both of these concepts or, or capabilities that are emerging in different programming languages. One of these is automatic differentiation, sometimes called in the more, um, the more extensive sense differentiable programming, which is where your entire program, you can just calculate derivatives of. Uh, the other is this thing called multiple dispatch. So I think the best way to show this is by actually showing, demonstrating. So let me start a new share here. There we go. All right. Does everybody see a uh, console here? This is um, this is a language called Julia. It's uh, it's not the only language that has these capabilities, but it's one I use most of the time now. Um, it looks interpreted. You know, you can do one plus one equals two, but it's actually compiled. Uh, so first, for automatic differentiation. So there are, there are various projects. Uh, in various languages that are trying to, to add the capability for automatic differentiation. Uh, there's uh, Google's putting a lot of time and money into Swift for TensorFlow right now, uh, which is basically adding it to Apple's, adding automatic differentiation to, to Apple's Swift language. Uh, there's JAX for Python. Uh, and in Julia, there's sort of five or six different implementations of this, um, each with you know, taking different approaches with different uh, trade-offs. Uh, so we, I'm going to use one called zygote here. Um, so with zygote, you can take the gradient of a function. So let's say we have, let's, let's take a, a simple function, f of x is x squared. So it's probably not surprising that you can differentiate a function like this. You know, if you've ever used Mathematica, this is really easy. Um, so if we, let's say we say f of 2, which should be 4, right? Yeah. Squared is 4. Uh, if you want to take the gradient of this, you can do gradient at two, and oh, look at that. Um, it's the same thing. So if we do f, you can also write this as f prime of two, uh, f prime of et cetera. Um, so let's, let's just plot this. Um, x is. Um, we want to apply f to every element of x. We use a dot in Julia there. Uh, so there's f x uh, x and f of x. It's it's a parabola. If we then look at f prime, the first derivative. Ah, well, it's going to be a line. Great. Okay, so this this is pretty pretty simple. Um, no, we can we can do we can do higher order different derivatives too, of course. Um, that may take longer. Second derivative is just constant two. Okay, that's pretty ordinary. Let's try a different function though. So let's try g of x. Um, let's see, which I've defined ahead of time. So if x is less than zero, it's x squared times uh, e to the minus x squared. If it's positive, then it's just x squared. So this is, we have control flow in this function. We have an if statement. So this is a little harder to differentiate, but it turns out you can, you can differentiate through control flow these days. Uh, you can differentiate differentiate uh, um, if statements. Uh, and it basically just gives you a piecewise defined function. So if we try g of x here, okay, there's our piecewise defined function, g prime of x. Oh, there's the first derivative, second derivative. So, okay, so th this, is, this is simple in one sense, but it's also really uh, 
transformative for fields where you need to know the gradient at the same time as you need your function. So um, neural networks are one place where having a, a built-in gradient is really huge. It basically improves your back propagation a lot. Uh, another field where this matters is, is uh, perhaps more obviously differential equations, but there's different trade-offs in terms of you know, precision versus speed you want for each of those. Um, Zyga, this one is, this is source to source automatic differentiation. So it actually looks at the source code and figures out what the derivative should be. Um, the other thing, which is um, a little bit more esoteric, um, I think equally important is this, uh, this idea of multiple dispatch and composability. Let's see. Okay, so uh, in Julia, there, there are other languages you can do this too, but in Julia, uh, you can define your own types that have the same performance as built-in types. So um, I'm gonna define here, let's define a type that's for composition. So uh, struct composition, I'm just gonna put lanthanum and ytterbium in here. We've been talking about these for now, so I'll know what those are. Uh, and then let's say A, A equals a composition with, uh, you know, 3.5 ppm lanthanum, 1.1 of ytterbium. Okay, fine. B, do another one. Okay, uh, can we add these two? Um, no, this is not gonna work, right? I haven't told the system how to, how to add these two. But um, with multiple dispatch, Multiple dispatch basically means it's, it's sort of something that you, if you don't program, you may assume that all functions automatically do. Uh, it's that a function can dispatch different methods if you give it different types of data. So um, what this means is that we can actually import uh, and extend the base methods for addition. So let's see, do in, uh, import, let's see, import base dot plus um, function, where's my base dot plus? So function plus, I'm gonna define for A, which is a, a composition, and B, which is a composition, uh, return, you know, add the two compositions, okay. So now we can do A plus B, and it works. Um, and you know, usually you're not supposed to overload operators, that's scary, but with multiple dispatch, you can do that. You can extend the base operators of the language, and it just works. Um, so let's do another one, import base dot times, times is, basically the same thing. It's gonna let us multiply a number by the composition. So now we can do 0 0.5 times A plus 0 0.5 times B, and it actually works. Uh, and uh, what, what's potentially even more impressive is if you wanna look at what this actually does in terms of machine, machine code, you can use this code native macro uh, and you'll see the actual machine code instructions. Uh, so this is, this is telling you what function it's in. So th basically there's some moves, you're moving and circles around from one register to another. And basically it does this all with one vectorized add. So it compresses all the really important stuff into just one, one, uh, one machine instruction um, using the, you know, the correct uh, AVX and uh, extensions and everything. Uh, so, so this is fast basically to take on point. You're doing this in, in like four clock cycles, uh, even though we're doing this on a custom type that we define overloading base operators. Uh, we can do another one, import. Um, if you want to import base dot display, we can change how these print. So, uh, just uh, so you, can, you can make this actually, instead of just saying, oh, this, this type, you can actually change how the language prints this, uh, this data type. So this is only possible because of having a type system and multiple dispatch that lets you define a new base function, tells other packages how to, how to deal with your data type. So the, the take home from this is that this allows composability, which is you can write a, pro, uh, a package which tells everyone else how to deal with geochemical data and then someone else's pro, uh, package that does differential equations or clustering or something else. Can, if you define all your, your basic mathematical functions, addition, subtraction, multiplication, it will just work. And this is kind of magic. Uh, if you wanna see more about this, there's a YouTube talk uh, by Stefan Karpinski called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Multiple Dispatch. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, these are things that I think are just going to be incredibly useful for all sorts of data science in the future. So I'm going to leave it there.